also I have to say in, in um, many ways parallels a lot that uh, Bob Schaaf's just been saying. Um, and uh, I agree with a lot of the critical perspective which he, he's just developed and pre presented very, very clearly and, and, and compellingly. Um, but I want to move things a little bit more into the, the context of, of how the, the mindfulness movement has ac actually incorporated some, some of these approaches and, and, and perhaps to give a slightly more positive spin on the whole process. Um, <laughs> Not so much because I, I, I dismiss the the the, um, uh, the criticisms, but because I I think I see the mindfulness movement uh, as as something of an opening to a a variety of different approaches to uh, uh, possibly therapeutic modalities deriving from Buddhist and and for that matter other non-Western contexts and that to focus exclusively on the limitations of, of, of the um, uh, initial uh, models that were adopted, uh, although they've certainly been central and influential, might be to uh, dismiss that something rather larger and, uh, and with perhaps rather more longer term potential is also happening. So, uh, we were all actually told to produce the, the <laughs> <laughs> conflict of interest disclosure statement. Here is mine, which again says, uh, uh, I'm totally innocent. <laughs> I'm in no way. <laughs> okay. Um, and this uh, is a... There's a certain amount of uh, technical stuff going on. Oh, and, and I should say also um, thanks very much to Lawrence for, uh, and, and to the organizers of this conference for inviting me. And, and it's, it's a great pleasure to be here. And, uh, uh, and thanks to everyone for the, the smooth and efficient arrangements for the event, which and so far are <laughs> working pretty smoothly, I think. Um, probably everyone here is aware of the increasing popularity and scale of what's come to be called the mindfulness movement, but this is just a, a quick reminder. Um, this is from a, a recent survey introducing a special issue on mindfulness approaches of the journal Contemporary Buddhism, one of a number of special issues dealing with mindfulness that have already appeared. Um, and uh, uh, in this, Mark Williams and John Kabat-Zinn, who, who are, uh, of course, key players in this whole process, um, presented this rather scary graph, um, at least for those of us who might be trying to keep up with the literature, <laughs> uh, uh, suggesting that by 2010, the number of publications per year about mindfulness had reached 350. Uh, by now, presumably, it's well over 500. Um, and this, of course, reflects a similar and, and numerically much larger growth in the number of people undertaking one or another form of mindfulness practice in therapeutic contexts. Now, in general terms, I, I would agree that this is probably a good thing for a variety of reasons. Uh, one is that at a time of the increasing medicalization of just about all human behavior, uh, mindfulness researchers provide renewed intellectual weight for therapies that don't use drugs and don't, as far as we know, have serious unintended side effects. Um, of course, if we end up with uh, mass enlightenment of the human species, that might be a very serious unintended side effect, but we'll leave that for the moment. If, if mindfulness-based interventions don't, in and of themselves, resist the medicalization of human life, they do at least limit some of the damage it might cause through the overuse of powerful pharmacological agents. Whether the mindfulness techniques do all that they are claimed to do as therapeutic interventions is another question. My impression is that we're some way from being able to demonstrate that they do, particularly when it comes to tracing specific effects of the practices. People feel better when they do them, but how and why isn't so clear, or what one practice might do as distinct from another. My own orientation towards the issue, and uh, Lawrence already said a little about that, is mainly as that of a social anthropologist, though one with a prior background in natural science and extensive involvement in Buddhist studies. <coughs> 
In recent years, I've been particularly engaged with work on Tibetan medicine and Tibetan healing traditions. Also, while I wouldn't claim to be a Buddhist in any very assertive sense, Buddhist practice of various kinds has been quite important in my life over many years. So I suppose I'm approaching this as a, a scientist of sorts, an anthropologist, a specialist in Buddhist studies, a somewhat intermittent Buddhist practitioner. As is fairly well known, the interest in mindfulness as a therapeutic modality got going in Western societies in about 1979 with John Kabat-Zinn's introduction of the Mindfulness-Based Stress Reduction Program, also known as MBSR. This is a, a field beset by acronyms, as many of you will know, um, and most of this is probably pretty familiar. And of course, we've already heard about the the moment-to-moment -moment non judgmental awareness, which is the, the central theme of M MBSR and many of the other early mindfulness-based practices. This was a program initially aimed at people with a wide range of chronic pain and stress-related disorders, so not particularly specific in, it, in, in its results, uh, in its uh, intention. The core techniques are, of course, as we've heard, drawn from Buddhist meditational practice and and fairly directly from traditions of lay Buddhist practice that were developed in the Theravada Buddhist countries of Burma and Thailand, and taught quite widely in Western Buddhist contexts in North America and elsewhere from the 1960s and 70s onwards. This forms a, a background to the growth of mindfulness techniques that isn't necessarily obvious if you're encountering these practices initially in the clinical context, and, and so maybe this help to reinforce a few of the connections between what Bob was saying and, and what we're encountering in, the, in the, the clinical context of mindfulness practice. The meditation practice that formed the basis of MBSR, and we've al already heard some of that, had gone through several successive stages of modernization, secularization, and adaptation before it was further adapted to form the basis of a, a clinical intervention at the University of Massachusetts Medical Center, and that's a kind of rough diagrammatic uh, uh, depiction of that process. And as we've already heard, this is a process on the way. There are a number of questions about just what is happening and what's being passed on. Particularly central here were the various Vipassana lineages deriving from Esen Goenka and before him from the Burmese teacher Sergei uh, Uberkin. And uh, we've heard some of the other figures involved, again, in, 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 in Bob's paper. Ubar Kin was not a monk or a full-time meditation teacher. He was a senior civil servant. He was actually the first accountant general of independent Burma. Um, he started a, a Vipassana group in the accountant general's office in 1950, apparently. And this whole tradition of meditation was part of this newly developing lay meditation movement. Um, Uberkin's student, S.N. Goenka, um, who we'll be hearing more about from Lauren Lev in, 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 in the, the modern Nep uh, Nepali context, was similarly a layman, not a monk. There are other related traditions of Vipassana, such as that associated with the Thai teacher Ajahn Chah, taught in the USA by Jack Cornfield and others, uh, that taught by another Thai teacher, Ajahn Diravamsa, and so on. And by 1979, there were certainly many thousands probably tens of thousands of people in North America who had experienced one or another of these practices. So we have this progression. While these <coughs> techniques claim continuity with the tradition of Buddhist meditation going back to the early period of Buddhism, the lay meditation tradition in Burma and Thailand is much more recent than that. And again, we've already heard something about that from Bob. In its present form, it's a 20th century development it's by no means clear how far back the specific techniques go either, although many of them are, are clearly quite modern. And there is, as we've heard, controversy about whether these are traditional, appropriate, or whatever. Now, I think this whole question of authenticity can be a distraction, and I don't want to make too much of it. Buddhist, myself, Buddhist traditions develop and change. Um, as Bob again pointed out, this kind of thing was going on back in 6th century China, and uh, uh, one can find similar disputes in the Tibetan context. But it is worth noting that the immediate sources of the mindfulness approaches are part of what one could call a Buddhist modernism or a modernist form of Buddhism. And one of the 
features of this and of other Buddhist modernisms, this is a point which Bob has elsewhere made quite forcibly, is precisely that the Buddhist modernists started to regard meditation as a central part of Buddhism, as part of a valuing of experience over ritual practice and other, other aspects of traditional Buddhism. Whether Buddhism historically has been about meditation at all, or perhaps one might sort of say more, more, a little less controversially, whether how, how major a part of, of, of Buddhist, the Buddhist tradition meditation has been in practice is very much something which is open to, to uh, question. To the extent that serious meditation practice took place at all, even in places like Tibet and Burma that maintained significant meditation traditions, uh, it was something that involved a small minority of monastic practitioners. In the Tibetan context, also a small number of, of lay yogic practitioners. How and when the Buddhist modernists came to take meditation as the essential core of Buddhism is an interesting story that has a lot to do with the early interactions between Western and Buddhist traditions of knowledge. Again, like, like Bob, I'm not going to be going into that in detail today. But it was linked to a kind of repackaging of Theravada Buddhism as something that can be incorporated into a modern and secular lifestyle that could be done, as we've heard, be without becoming a celibate monk. And that, in its way, was perhaps a bigger change than any transformation that took place in the, the actual technique of meditation. While MBSR was the first and is probably still the best known of the mindfulness-based techniques, it inspired a variety of other related approaches, such as MBCT, or mindfulness-based cognitive therapy, which was designed as a therapeutic intervention for people with major depressive disorder. Um, then there are a number of further related approaches, mostly in the area of anxiety disorders, as well as, and, and this is where I think things start to get rather, rather, rather interesting, a series of approaches and interventions based on other meditation, Buddhist meditational techniques. And we'll be hearing today about techniques derivative from shamatha meditation. Um, meditation on metta, which focuses on developing empathy for the happiness of others, and so on. And um, we'll be hearing about uh, a Japanese technique, Nikan, which has become quite influential within Europe. So this, I think, is where we can start to counter some, some of the, the or, or, um, or, or, or look a bit more critically at some, some of the questions of, uh, are we adopting a form of Buddhist practice which is kind of morally and ethically vacuous, which loses out on the, the total content of, of, of Buddhism as it has been practiced in, in, in its original context. Um, because I think some of these, these approaches um, highlight much more of a, a moral, moral and ethical dimension. And I, I think, uh, actually, to be, to be fair even to, to a, a, a teacher like Goenka, um, uh, despite the emphasis on the scientific, non-judgmental, et cetera, approach within the practice, um, he tended to present it within an overall context, which still had quite a strong ethical and dharmic uh, viewpoint. So uh, I, I think it's worth re retaining an awareness both of, of some of that and of, and, and of this fact that we're looking at a, a very much a moving scene, which is beginning to introduce other sorts of practices as well, um, some of which have more continuity, perhaps with some of the dimensions that, that the critiques of uh, mindfulness uh, have pointed to, to, to uh, pointed as an omissions within the mindfulness approaches. But it's certainly worth noting that this whole body of approaches has been extraordinarily successful. It's achieved recognition from mainstream biomedical institutions, um, that's most famously the National Institute for Clinical Excellence in the UK. Um, the government uh, body that, that advises on such matters uh, by uh, in, uh, uh, recommended in its 2009 guidelines on depression uh, that MBCT, mindfulness-based cognitive therapy, um, should be the, the appropriate uh, approach for people who are currently well but have experienced three or more episodes of depression. Um, if one thinks of the financial interests involved in the market in antidepressant drugs, this is actually quite a major achievement and quite a major shift in um, approaches to psychiatric illness. Um, 
Now, all of this is very interesting, and for those of us who've been around long enough to remember what the world of medical and psychiatric treatment was like even in the 1960s and 1970s, it's also quite remarkable just how much things have changed. As uh, John Kabat-Zinn and Mark Williams say in, the, in their introduction to this previously mentioned special issue of contemporary Buddhism, there's a convergence here of two different epistemologies and cultures, namely that of, of science and the contemplative disciplines. Um, epistemologies and cultures which in other contexts often appear as radically incompatible. But I would want to add that this question of science and Buddhism um, is really quite tricky. Uh, by now it's fairly clear, at least in Buddhist studies circles, that much of the rhetoric about Buddhism being a scientific and empirical tradition rather than a religion goes back to the growth of Buddhist modernism in the early late 19th and early 20th century. It's so mainly a Sri Lankan rather than a Burmese development and doesn't have much to do with Buddhism as it actually was in the lives of most Asian Buddhists until recent times. I'm not suggesting here, certainly, that Buddhism didn't have a strong intellectual, scholarly, and philosophical component, and even that aspects of what that included might be regarded as scientific, depending on your personal definition of science, which, of course, is a pretty slippery term. But the intellectual and scientific component of Buddhism was an integral part of a tradition that had concerns very different from those of modern science, or for that matter, modern psychiatry. It's only with the modernist rewriting of Buddhism, precisely to present it as a rational empirical tradition, that one can start to make claims about Buddhist science as something that can be, that can be engaged with in its own right without taking on the rest of the tradition. And I think this underlies a lot of the discourse of, of, of people like, like Kabat-Zinn. Um, I think one can see this rather clearly by contrast in, in, in the, the dialogues between Buddhism and science that have taken place in the context of His Holiness the Dalai Lama's Mind, Mind Life Institute, um, where um, I think the dialogues that have taken place under the auspices of the, the Institute have often been fascinating occasions, at least insofar as I can tell as mostly non-participant. But I think that it's arguable that there are very real limits to how much dialogue can actually take place within that kind of context. Um, and that's in part because the Dalai Lama's own Buddhist tradition, by contrast to, to the, uh, what we, we've been talking about in the mindfulness context, is, uh, is definitely not one that's been reconstructed in modernist terms. That, that's something I've, I've, I've uh, been engaged with a bit elsewhere. That I, I, I'll, I'll skip saying more about it here. But more generally, it's worth pointing out that for all of the Buddhist tradition's fondness for the image of the Buddha as the great physician, Buddhism did not begin as anything that resembled a form of therapy or clinical intervention, again, something that Bob's pointed out. It was an ascetic path to which the suffering intrinsic in human experience was presented as a motivation. And um, I, I'll just present a slide that somebody who, uh, in fact, Bob has al also already mentioned, the Sinhalese anthropologist, Gananatobio Sekere, who argued many years ago in 1985 that what Western society would term depression might be seen as in Sri Lanka as the mark of a good Buddhist, as a socially appropriate orientation. And I, I should add that he was he was explicitly talking about depression as clinically defined by Western psychiatry. Um, this was part, and, and he, he, he goes on to argue that depression as a clinical entity was a creation of Western psychiatry and concludes with a critique of early versions of, of, uh, of DSM, of, of the American Psychiatric Association's Diagnostic, Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, uh, so and that many of the issues about the cross-cultural critique of diagnostic categories that uh, Lawrence mentioned at the beginning uh, are very much already being raised at this time and, 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 of course, are very much alive in relation to later iterations of DSM, such as the one that's DSM-5, which has just been released. Now, Obiaseka was not denying the reality of the human distress that might be involved either in the West or Sri Lanka, but he was certainly suggesting that Buddhists would not necessarily see the relief of depression in terms of the achievement of a better or more positive adjustment to one's social context. Ultimately, there's no point in learning to live with samsara. It will always let you down in the end. Um, 
but given that, it's intriguing and a little ironic that the area in which mindfulness-based techniques have achieved some of their greatest successes so far is precisely the treatment of depression. Now, all this doesn't mean that techniques borrowed from an Asian context where they're intended to do one kind of thing may not be successfully adapted within a Western context and used to do something quite different. But I think it does become apparent when we look more closely at these issues that the Western appropriation of something called mindfulness as a therapeutic modality is quite a complex and curious affair. And what I, I, I'll uh, do in the, the remaining part of this is just to say, emphasize a little bit more what the secularization involves and then look at one of the things that has been left, I think specifically left out, which is the question of non-self, which is closely related in a way to the, the social dimension of, of Buddhism. So here we can see um, Mark Williams and Cabot Zinn uh, telling us that the roots of Buddhist meditation practices are de facto universal. This is about embodied awareness and the cultivation of clarity. Anybody can do this. It's nothing to do with Buddhism. Um, this is the line that uh, Kabat Zinn was, was, in fact, using for many years before that. Um, Buddhism is neither a belief, an ideology, nor a philosophy. This is a classic Buddhist modernist uh, line. Um, it's a a it's a coherent phenomenological description of the nature of mind and so on. Um, mindfulness is of necessity universal. There is nothing particularly Buddhist about it and so on. Um, and if you look at the website of the Vipassana movement to move back a step from, from mindfulness, you see very much the same kind of thing. This is a non-sectarian technique aiming for, now if, if you're a Buddhist and you read this, you actually can pick up some of the Buddhist code words. This is the eradication of mental impurities, the highest happiness, the full liberation and so on. But what you also see here, the word Buddhism doesn't appear on that page or very often on the Vipassana website. And we very much have a picture of something that is scientific, um, uh, that is uh, abstractable, from the Buddhist context almost entirely, and, and that, that can be described in very secular terms. By contrast, go back to the Visuddhimagga, the um, classic meditation manual of Buddha Gosa, who Bob, Bob mentioned before, and it's very explicit, all of this is about central Buddhist teachings. This is just a quote which, which points out, which, which is about no self. Um, doing exists, there is no doer. There is suffering, but none who suffers. Um, although there is a path, there is no goal. Well, okay, um, what do we do with, with, with this, this kind of, of, of conflict? And what does it actually mean? And does it matter? Um, and here we clearly have a range of possible options. One is to say we've got a useful bit of therapy. It seems to be doing something um, Let's work with it. Um, the, other, the other option is to say, um, this is completely untrue to the, to the tradition. Uh, this is not what it's about. Um, it seems to me that we can take something of a middle path here, um, to use another rather Buddhist phrase. Um, if we look at the process of, of, of non-self, um, less in terms of a central Buddhist emphasis that has to be maintained in anything that has the word meditation attached to it, and look at it a little more in terms of its connection with the, the ethical and moral, moral dimensions of Buddhism, with, with the, the, the cultivation of a sense of, uh, of compassion of the social dimensions of Buddhism, then I think we can see a little more of what it is that might be left out and how it is we might be able to reinsert it and how in fact it is being reinserted and that I think is where, where it's quite interesting to look at the use of meta, meta meditation um, a, a form of meditation that has an explicit social dimension the cultivation of compassion um, to look at something like Nikan which is coming out of a, a, a Japanese context where again the the 
the social dimensions of Buddhism are very clear and, and, and where the, the process itself is working very much with those. Um, I've uh, talked Elsa about the, the possibilities of, of, of using forms of Tibetan meditation. This is in the, the context of, of um, some work on uh, autism spectrum conditions and, and religion, where it seemed to me that uh, one could use, uh, one, one could look at, yeah, thanks, um, uh, one could look at uh, the formal and elaborate and complex and at one level quite theologically loaded um, practices of tantric meditation actually is quite appropriate to people with certain sorts of, of um, uh, what's the word, maybe neurodiversity is the, is, is, is the most appropriate word to use in that context, as something that, uh, uh, and in fact, the, and, and part of the point, I think, that I'd, one of the things I'd like to bring a bit to this discussion is that rather than looking at a sort of one-size-fits-all uh, bare mindfulness. Actually, we're looking at a tradition that has a tremendous range of possibly, possibilities within it, of, of possible approaches that might be relevant to people who are coming from different places, who have different uh, ways of, of understanding and dealing with the world, and, um, uh, and, and who are perhaps looking for different kinds of therapeutic modalities. So that, I think, and maybe I, I will actually just wrap up there so, so we don't fall too much behind with the program, is where I, is what, what I, I, would, I think we could be considering in relation to this whole area, not so much mindfulness in a narrow sense as, as uh, the, the, uh, uh, the final statement about what it is we can extract from Buddhism and process into the Western therapeutic context, but as mindfulness as an opening, a point of access which can lead us to look at a much wider range of possibilities that can be taken from Buddhism and from, from other non-Western traditions. And I think that as that process goes on, perhaps also some of, some of the, the narrow linkage between uh, modernist scientific Buddhism and uh, biomedical science might be replaced by a rather fuller and deeper dialogue in which both sides get shifted a bit. So I'll, I'll stop there.